Hello all and welcome, and I am the MGTOW Philosopher. And this video is sponsored by a donation from Dreadguard. Thank you very much, Dreadguard. That's a bit of an old story, but Dreadguard wanted me to comment on it, and once I read it, I realized just how interesting and pertinent this was to the MGTOW community, so I thought I would address it. Now the story begins, and this is back in 2011, as I said, this is a request video. Dad leaves clues to his desperation. So a man by the name of Thomas Ball killed himself back in 2011 by lighting himself on fire in protest of the unfair treatment he had received over a 10-year divorce battle. That's right. His ex-wife put him through the ringer for 10 years. And I think after you are done reading and listening to reading this story and listening to this story, you will see just how effed up the divorce courts and the courts in general are in the West towards men. So, a grisly suicide after a 10-year divorce battle. And it begins with a picture of Thomas Ball. And he says, I miss you already. Thomas Ball wrote to a friend shortly before he set himself on fire. So imagine the amount of desperation you would have to have to do something like that. It's kind of message you're trying to send. So let's begin with the story, shall we? Keen. New Hampshire on a mid-June afternoon, an unemployed history buff from Holton. Yeah, he's unemployed because his wife sucked him dry and he's so depressed and so desperate and so down in the dumps. Big surprise. I'm surprised he hadn't killed himself already. Uh, the guy lasted 10 years. Good Lord. From Holton, Massachusetts, announced cryptically on his Facebook page that D-Day had arrived. Time to climb down into the Higgins boat and take a bouncing ride to the beach, wrote Thomas Ball, referring to the World War II amphibious landing craft. Four hours later, later, the divorced father of three died outside a courthouse in downtown Keene after igniting himself in a gory self-immolation. Good Lord. Engulfed in flame, he screamed as he stumbled from the courthouse steps, fell to his hands and knees, and eventually fell silent. My question is, where were the people? Wasn't there anybody around? Wasn't there somebody that tried to put him out? I mean, good Lord. <sighs> God. Uh, Ball's final words were delivered in the next day's mail, uh, which, by the way, were a very large manifesto, which I may or may not make a video on because it's just so huge. If I do make a, a video, it's going to have to be multiple videos. A friend in New Hampshire got a card with the tender inscription, I miss you already. The story goes on to say the Keene Sentinel received a biting screed against the legal system in which Ball recounted the ongoing 10-year court battle over his divorce, child support payments, and visitation rights with his children. Meaning she wouldn't let him see the kids, and the court said, meh, we don't care, you're a man. A man walks up to the main door of the Keene, New Hampshire County Courthouse, douses himself with gasoline, and lights a match. Ball's letter begins, and everybody wants to know why. Such a desperate act would be shocking anywhere, but in the middle of a quaint New England college town at the end of what Ball had once called the prettiest Main Street in America, it seems unthinkable. His death and final writings have resonated within the father's rights movement, of which he was an active member and revealed a stubborn man consumed by his court battles and, over time, sinking further into darkness. Well, I don't know that I would define a man who wants to see his children but can't see his children and continues to try to see his children as necessarily a, a, a bad thing that he's stubborn. I mean, I love how this article tries to, even in the most subtle ways, paint him in a negative light, of course. I mean, he's not going to go outright and try to do that. Uh, they'll let the uh, ex-wife do that for him. Story goes on to say, Ball, 58, intended his fiery death on June 15th, planned and researched at least 10 days in advance to be the ultimate profane gesture. Says who, ultimate profane? Did he say it's meant to be the ultimate profane gesture, or is that your wording, huh? He was taking aim squarely at the courts he blamed for keeping him apart from his kids. Yeah, I, I, I would blame them if they're responsible. Yeah, they're not doing anything to uh, let me see my kids. And for what he saw as the system's corrupt and ruthless emasculation of divorced dads. <laughs> Sounds about right. Face it, boys. We are no longer fathers, Ball wrote. We are piggy banks. Eh, that's correct. 
Once the woman gets custody, which happens about 90% of the time, then 5% of the time, the state gets custody. And then like the other like three, four, I think it's like five to 7% of the time. They're like 3% of the time the father gets custody, like two, 3% of the time. So yeah, the woman always gets custody. And when that happens, you are done being a father because women are malicious and evil and they don't care about their kids. They only care about, for some reason, trying to hurt you. And they don't need you anymore. They need your money, of course, but they don't want you to come with the package of the dough. They just want the dough. You, well, they don't want you around their children. Now, the courts and his former wife tell a different story. What do you mean the court? You mean his wife tells a different story and the courts believed her because she has a vagina. They paint a picture of a prideful and headstrong man. Prideful and headstrong, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. It just sounds like you're throwing out these adjectives to try and paint them in a negative light, but that doesn't mean anything to me. You're not backing it up with things he did that were prideful and headstrong. Ah, this is the wife's word. So he's a man who once lost his temper and slapped his four-year-old daughter. Once? That's it? I would say a man whose entire fatherhood, he, he whacked his kid one time. I mean, you're not supposed to hit your kids, of course, but, if, and by the way, we only have her word for this. Do we have any evidence for this? Do we have evidence for this? A four-year-old is just going to say whatever a mother tells her to. Do we even know if the daughter cooperates this? We have no evidence that he ever hit his kids. I'd be willing to bet that he didn't, and this is just something she said to essentially get him out of the picture so that he wouldn't have any rights to see his kids and she wouldn't have to shuttle them back and forth between his house and her house because, oh, that's just too inconvenient. Oh, he slapped hard enough to draw blood. Meanwhile, some chick in Australia is going to throw her kid off a balcony and then beats the, the little girl up with a spoon, and she gets probation and is probably going to get custody, uh, or at least partial custody of that child. I mean, what are you talking about here? Yeah, oh, he actually hit his child once? Maybe. Maybe. If it did happen, it's wrong, but that's not a reason to stop him from seeing his kids. Well, what is it with these courts? Every time a woman comes in and she does something horrible to her kids, abuses her kids, they, they're like, well, you have no history and it's only happened once as far as we know. So this is an isolated incident and this is not enough to keep you from being able to see your children as if, uh, oh, as if stopping the kids from seeing the mother is somehow worse than the father being stopped from seeing them. Oh, we cannot have the mother barred from the, seeing the kids, no matter what. She, she could put them in a microwave and try to cook them. But, oh, it's an isolated incident, so we can't bar you from seeing your kids because the mother's just too important. The father always oh, slapped the kid once, once in his whole life. Oh, well, that's just too horrible. Let's bar him from seeing the kid. If that even happened, we know how much mothers lie, and there's no counterproof because everybody believes the woman. Okay, so, oh, he, she says that you hit your kid. Well, we have to err on the side of caution, as courts always do, so you can't see your children. Case closed. I don't believe anything this woman says. And when they say court tells a different story, no, the wife, the wife, and then chose to remain estranged from his children rather than acknowledge he made a mistake and participate in court-ordered counseling. Yeah, gee, I wonder why a guy who is being accused of something and if he actually did it, why he wouldn't go to court-ordered counseling and then be able to see his kids? Huh. Could it be because he probably didn't do it? If the guy had done it, I have no doubt that he would have went to court-ordered counseling, as would I have, if it would allow me to see my kids. But if I didn't do it, there's no freaking way that I would go to counseling. So if he's prideful, yeah, he's prideful and headstrong because he wouldn't bow down to a false order from the court, a false order predicated on a false allegation of child abuse. Yes, I'm being accused of beating my children, and I didn't do it, but I'm going to be prideful and headstrong and, uh, you know, deny it because it didn't happen. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I love how they label something that's a good quality, uh, not bowing down to lies as some kind of bad quality. Yeah, that evil man, he should just go along with the system. He should just know how the system is, and then he's going to be lied about, and he should jump through the proper hoops. Oh, yeah. Shame on that evil SOB for not bowing down to the court's order to go to counseling, even though he did nothing wrong. Because I can't imagine this guy, a guy who loved his kids enough to fight for 10 years and go through all this rigmarole and would eventually burn himself to death, somebody that's that principled, and believe me, you have to have a lot of hardcore principles, and you have to really believe 
in those principles to kill yourself like that, uh, that that guy, he would have went to court-ordered counseling if he had done something wrong. He'd have acknowledged his wrongdoing. Somebody who went to the extent that this guy went to had pride. Real pride, not fake pride. And pride in himself, pride in his ideals. He had real principles. And if he did something wrong, I have no doubt he would have taken responsibility. His actions and how he killed himself tell me that. As well as his long struggle. He cared. And this makes no sense that this man wouldn't go to court-ordered counseling from all of the concern he's shown up until this point and all the hard work, and, 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 he, and he could have just, if he had just went to that counseling, he, th- th- there would have been no problems. Could have seen his kids. And you're telling me that this guy, who is principal and uh, shows that much character, is just being stubborn and doesn't want to admit he made a mistake? The evidence says otherwise. Paul's love for his children made it impossible for him to accept that some of his actions were harmful to them. His former wife, Karen. Yeah, of course the wife is going to say bad things about him. Hey, Karen, did you stop and think that what you're saying right now is probably projection and you were projecting your own guilty feelings and that you and your actions were harmful to your children? Oh, no, you're a woman. It's all your husband's fault, of course, said Thursday in an email. He was unable to comply with the court's requirement to meet with the children's, children's counselor because to do so would mean acknowledging that he had done something to warrant the requirement. Or you are a lying SOB. You made that up just so he wouldn't be able to see his kids and just so you wouldn't have to deal with him so you could be vindictive. How about that? So I'll continue this in the next part. Thanks and take care.